Yeah. So I'm delighted for the invitation and uh, looking forward to talking about some of the work that I've been doing. Uh, just could you, Rodrigo, let me know, that, uh, is everything being shared okay? Can you see my yep. Um, yep. presentation? Yeah, we can see Perfect. your pointer, those slides. Uh, excellent, yeah. So I'll uh, jump right into the presentation. So um, again, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm gonna talk to you about some of the work that I've been doing on using multi-type branching process is to model complex contagion on clustered networks. So this is kind of branching process kind of work. Um, so as Rodrigo said, I'm doing this work in the University of Limerick where I'm a lecturer. Um, I'm previously of your parish. I did my uh, postdoc with um, Renault and um, Peter Grinrod. And now I'm back uh, like a boomerang in Limerick again, uh, working on uh, contagion on networks. Uh, trying to advance my, yeah. So before we delve into branching processes, I uh, just want to um, just give a little bit of a, a shout out to some of the people that I uh, did this work with. Uh, so this is my uh, PhD student, uh, Leah Keating on the left. Um, a lot of the pretty plots that you're about to see is a lot of her hard work. And this is also work that we did uh, with James, uh, Professor James Gleason. And what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, a simple branching process model for complex contagion on networks. So when I say a simple uh, model, uh, what I mean is like more of a toy model. So we're gonna work through some simple network topologies and some simple kind of multi-type branching process uh, structures to give us like an indication of how we might extend this theory to effectively uh, encapsulate the presence of clustering on networks, which is a challenge for kind of classical uh, branching process theory, and how we can use that to model a complex contagion. But we're all networks people here, so why are we actually doing this? Well, if we're all interested in networks, by and large, a lot of us are gonna be interested in how things spread on actual networks. Um, and I'm specifically interested in kind of cascade dynamics on networks. So, uh, how can information propagate through a network? What drives individuals to actually adopt pieces of information on an actual network? Um, what kind of cascade structures can we actually extract um, from the kind of diffusions that you might see on Twitter and these kind of places? And specifically in this talk, I want to focus on the kind of mechanisms of spread that you might observe for these kind of cascades. Uh, I'm gonna look at things called like a simple contagion versus a complex contagion. So when I'm talking about uh, a simple contagion, um, this is like very akin to a biological contagion where you might have uh, multiple exposures, but they're all independent of each other. So they don't change the probability that an individual might adopt a piece of uh, content, or if we're looking at a biological contagion, um, their chances to become infected themselves. So uh, if, for example, if I was to cough on someone very rudely and someone else was to do this uh, as well, they, they'd be two independent exposures. They wouldn't kind of interact with each other. Whereas a complex contagion is a case where um, you could imagine um, if you're exposed to something once, you might adopt, you might not adopt. But if you see it a second time, you might have a higher propensity to adopt because of that kind of social reinforcement that you get from multiple adoptions over what you would expect from a simple contagion. And heavily linked to the study of this kind of simple versus complex contagion is the effect of clustering on actual networks. So when I mentioned clustering, I'm not talking about the physical sense, I'm talking about the kind of network uh, topological kind of structure of the density of triangles in your actual network structure. So the idea is that if you have more um, clustering in your uh, network, that gives rise to these kind of transitive relationships that allow that provide much more chance of these kind of reinforcing signals. So then a complex contagion might do better on uh, those type of networks. While if you're looking at a simple contagion, the kind of theory of um, strength of weak ties might say, suggest that the more kind of random or less kind of clustered a network is, the more likely you are uh, to see like a simple contagion to actually do better on those kind of networks. So any kind of modeling framework that we're going to look at, at in a minute actually has to encapsulate that kind of simple uh, or that kind of clustering um, into naturally within its framework. So um, do we actually see complex contagions? Uh, so it actually has been noted in a couple of different papers. There's a very nice paper by Damien Santola where they did like an online experiment and showed that um, health-related behaviors or these kind of like fake uh, 
spreading of health related behaviors on kind of fake networks with where they kind of control the network topology um, results in uh, cascade dynamics that kind of result that look like uh, complex contagion. While this other paper by uh, Romero um, actually uh, shows that uh, complex contagion um, it exists in a couple of different facets of how information, different types of information diffuse in online um, settings. So it's, it's a thing and we like to be able to understand things. So this is what we're going to look at. Um, clustering is actually very well understood in the context of kind of compartmental models. So the, your classic SEIR kind of model. There's a very nice paper by uh, Herbert de Fres that um, allows you to capture the presence of clustering in, on, uh, in, in networks to see the effect on uh, these kind of compartmentalized models. Uh, we took uh, that uh, framework that he has in that paper that accounts for that clustering and extended it to a complex contagion in like a compartmental model uh, that is a SI type model uh, on networks as well. And we did some nice work around that in complex contagion. But as far as I could tell, uh, for cascade dynamics, and I, I'm open to corrections, so if anyone actually knows of anything along these lines, I'd be very happy to hear about those papers. Um, but uh, I haven't come across any papers that looked at complex contagion um, cascade dynamics using branching processes because it's actually a little bit difficult to account for the clustering of these on the actual network. So this is what we're going to attempt to do. Um, the branching process models that have been used or the, the kind of cascade models that you, that you might come across. Um, one of the very most popular ones is this model called the uh, independent cascade model. Um, it's been used in a couple of different settings. So you might see it in a uh, simulation based settings in this, in this first iteration. And we have done some work on using the independent cascade model with a branching process framework to kind of get some nice analytical results for the kind of ca uh, cascades that you might see under this setting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this ICM model, the uh, independent cascade model and extend it to a complex contagion and see what kind of cascades we can get it, uh, generate from it. So just a little bit of a recap. So the uh, independent cascade model is a discrete time uh, model. And what we have is we have a network where we uh, are just going to have uh, all nodes are inactive at we, we, uh, as we start off. We're just going to randomly select a single node as going to be our initial seed node. What's going to happen is that active node then is going to expose all of its neighbors to the contagion. Um, they are going to adopt the contagion independently with this one probability P1. Uh, more about P1 in a minute. Uh, if they do adopt, uh, they become active in the next time steps. The previously active nodes become inactive and take no further part. And the process continues on in this similar fashion until there is no more active nodes on the actual network. And this is going to terminate. And that's one kind of iteration of the algorithm that gives us one kind of example cascade. And we can run this over and over and over again to get an ensemble of possible cascades we might generate by this process. Um, very simple model. It's a very popular model. Uh, we, we like it because it's got a very simple mechanism. It's very easy to code up. It's very fast to simulate. Um, it's, it's possible to get some analytical results in a simple branching process framework, uh, but it's a simple contagion. So we'd like to look at a complex contagion um, extension of this. So to do this, we add a, a single parameter to the model. Uh, we're going to call this parameter alpha, and it's the strength of the social reinforcement that you get from multiple um, exposures to a piece of content. And if alpha is equal to zero, uh, it's going to return the independent cascade model. And the higher the alpha, the higher the social reinforcement. And it's, go it's going to be between zero and one. So if we focus on these uh, set of kind of triad of nodes here, before the last node became active, uh, it actually had uh two exposures so it's previously got an exposure from this node but chose not to adapt and then it got uh, an exposure from this node and re that results in an adoption so in a complex contagion framework those two adopt or those two exposures the second exposure would have increased the probability over p1 that the node will uh, actually adopt so what we do is we know that 
the probability that an individual won't adopt after a single exposure is one minus the probability. Sorry, the probability that a node will adopt after one exposure is equal to one minus probability that they won't adopt. And the way we encode or calculate P2, the probability that you will adopt after two exposures, is just one minus the probability that you won't adopt after one exposure times one minus alpha. And it's easier for us to encode the change in P2 as a decrease in uh, the probability that you won't adopt after two exposures. Now, if we have multiple exposures, three or four or five, we just increase that multiplicative factor that we're looking for. So uh, that just results in a decrease in the probability that you won't adopt, therefore, an increase in, your probability, in the probability that you will adopt after multiple exposures. Okay, that's very nice. So anytime in the subsequent slides that I'm talking about P1 or P2 or P3, all you need to know is that this is where our social reinforcement is going to come in. Anytime you have P2 or P3, um, this is where that alpha parameter is going to come in, and this is where the social reinforcement is going to come in. Okay, so we have this little model of complex contagion with this tunable parameters P1 and alpha that we can play around with. To get some insight on the behavior of a, uh, the cascades that we might observe under this model on some networks, let's just create, look at some toy networks with very kind of like simple network topologies that might give us an idea of how things spread um, on these type of, uh, from these type of cascades dynamics. So what we're gonna look at is K-regular clique type networks. Uh, we're gonna be very picky about the type of networks that we're gonna look at. They're gonna be homogeneous. Uh, they're gonna all have homogeneous degree distribution. They're gonna have the exact same degree uh, for each node on every uh, every node on each network, and they're gonna be the same across networks so you can do some comparison. So um, the only thing that's actually gonna change between the three network structures that we're gonna look at is the amount of clustering or the proportion of uh, transitive relationships in the local network topology for each node. So, we're going to have uh, three network structures. We're going to have an unclustered network structure. This one is going to be our first one, where each node is just simply uh, connected to six random neighbors, and there's going to be no um, clustering in the local network topology. So this is effectively going to have a clustering coefficient of zero. The second network structure is uh, each node is still going to have uh, the same number of neighbors. They're going to have six neighbors but pairs and neighbors are going to be connected to each other. And the way we say this is that each node is a, mem a member of three randomly chosen cliques uh, where, where each clique has three nodes. So we have one clique, two clique, three cliques here uh, for each node, leading to a degree of six, and each clique has three nodes in it. Uh, this is going to have, if we have this kind of... Uh, repetitive structure across the network. This is going to lead to a global clustering coefficient of 0 0.2 on the actual network that we're looking at. And then the final network that we might have, uh, or that we actually do have, or might have, we're actually going to look at it. Uh, the nodes, each node is going to be a member of two, four cliques. Um, so that's going to lead to a network uh, where each, uh, or where the global clustering coefficient on this network is going to be uh, 0 0.4. So we have an unclustered network, a moderately clustered network, and a uh, what we're going to call, call the highly clustered network, um, where the only thing that's changing is the presence of clustering. That will give us a handle on the effect of clustering on these kind of contagion dynamics that we're looking at in our kind of toy model. OK, so we're going to take the very simple case first, the six regular networks where no clustering, so alpha, there should be no effect of alpha here because there's no clustering on this network. We're just going to build up what a branching process is going to look like. It's going to be very simple. It's going to be very idealized, but it'll just give us a base to start building from. So if we start off with this node um, being active in kind of our ICM extension model, uh, and it's going to activate its neighbors um, uh, with each individual, the, it's got six neighbors that they're, we're each going to try to activate each one of those neighbors with an independent probability P1. It's, we're effectively rolling a binomial dice just to see how many activations we get. Uh, rolling that binomial dice, then this gives us a certain number of activations in the following step. And each one of those subsequent activations are going to try to activate their followers or their uh, network links in the actual uh, network structure 
uh, with um, IID probability. Um, so, or, uh, so all we have to do is roll a binomial dice for each one of those individually active nodes and just see how many uh, nodes we actually activate in turn. And the process continues on until we end up with uh, the ultimate cascade that we have. Now, we're, well, I'm interested in the kind of critical behavior of um, those other network structures that we're going to look at. So it might be handy if we were to look at the expected number of nodes in any subsequent generation that we think should be active and see what the interplay between P1, alpha, and the criticality is going to be. Now, there's no network clustering, so we don't expect alpha to play any part. So we expect the P1 to be the, the important parameter here. So if we wanted to calculate the expected number of nodes that should be active after the first generation from a single seed, well, we're just rolling a binomial dice from the six on the six neighbors of that particular node. Uh, so that's the um, expectation of a uh, binomial random variable. So that should give us some uh, measure of the expected number of nodes that are going to be active at, times, uh, at generation one. From generation zero, if we want to calculate another step ahead to the expected number of activations at generation two, well, we have a certain estimate of the uh, number of active nodes at generation one, then each one of these are going to activate their neighbors with um, the expectation of a binomial random variable with five, tri with five trials, because we're after burning one link coming into these nodes. We have five unactivated neighbors and uh, with the probability P1 and so on and so on and so on. So the further in time we go, um, we're just taking multiplications of this uh, expectation of this uh, binomial random variable. So we can calculate the expected value for any subsequent generation of the number of active nodes that we expect to have. And the important thing is that we have uh, a nice close form solution for this um, value. So if we have, uh, if we're looking at 10 generations in, uh, we can work out the expected number of active nodes. And this was what we call the expected of number of offspring, uh, this uh, expected value, which is corresponding to this mu in the kind of branching process literature. If this number is greater than one, um, we kind of get this kind of compound interest effect where we get exponential growth. Uh, if it's less than one, uh, we, um, the number of expected nodes we have in any subsequent generation as we look further and further into the future decreases towards zero. So, um, what is my point here? The, the, the point is like this, uh, this value here just controls the criticality of the actual system. It's greater than one, super critical, less than one, so critical. Right, so, so far, so simple, it's not particularly interesting. So we can work out where this very idealized example is going to be so or super critical, right? So if we are uh, looking at a, uh, a branching process on just this unclustered network structure with each node having six neighbors. Um, it's just uniquely defined by uh, whether we are, have a P1 greater than uh, 0 0.2 or less than 0 0.2. Okay, but what would we expect if we were looking at the other network structures that we talked about previously, the moderately clustered graph and the highly clustered graph? Well, if we had uh, alpha set to zero or alpha varying being very low, what we might expect because uh, this extra link here is effectively kind of redirecting um, some of the influence back or the, the, the probability to a node that we've already seen, we might expect that we might have a situation where the subcritical regime for these cluster networks might encroach on the supercritical regime where we observe the supercritical spreading for the unclustered graph because uh, there's no social reinforcement and we have some sort of redundant links. To, and we're not infecting kind of the maximum number of nodes that we have in the unclustered case. And we might get the converse in the case where we have very high social reinforcement, right? Where we might be able to create cases because of these extra links uh, where we get supercritical spreading in a region that we can't get supercritical spreading in the uh, other case, the unclustered network structure. But that's just like a qualitative idea of what, act, what, what we expect to actually happen in this setup. Is there any actual way that we can um, 
get an analytical result for where these network structures are like pro provide us with super or sub critical spreading. The problem that we have with this kind of previous branching process kind of very simple setup that I talked about is that there's no natural way for us to track the number of exposures for a node um, in this framework. So there's no natural way for us to say, right, we're trying to activate a node using a simple branching process uh, that already has two exposures, just three exposures, right? It's, it, well, to my mind, there's no natural way of doing this. But this is where our uh, multi-type branching process framework is going to come into it, right? So instead of tracking nodes, as we're doing in the uncluster un case, we're going to change our mindset to tracking cliques over time. So uh, in this case, each node is our member of three cliques, and what we're going to track is the diffusion pattern within each individual clique that we actually are going to have. So what we're going to say, if we're looking at these this three clique network, this moderately clustered network, we're going to say that a um, this clique structure is going to have like four life stages or clique diffusion motifs. We were going to have a Z1, a Z2, a Z3, and a Z4, where we're just going to track the number of uh, inactive nodes, active nodes, and removed nodes in each one of these cliques, and map out the possible diffusion patterns that we can actually have and the cases where the clique is, becomes inactive as well. So you can think of like this kind of like the life cycle of bacteria or something would be the analogous uh, quantity if you're looking at the multi-type branching process kind of theory. Okay, so if we have this Z1 clique with one active node and we're looking for the diffusion pattern inside this, um, what can happen in the next generation? Well, uh, if we fail to activate any nodes, the clique becomes inactive, right? Nothing happens, we fail to activate those, we don't care. Uh, in the case that we activate a single node, well, we go to, uh, in the next generation, the previously active node becomes inactive and we activate one of the nodes. We can also have a case where we go from Z1 to Z3, where we end up activating both nodes in the clique as well. So this is very analogous to what we had previously when we were looking at the kind of diffusion patterns with uh, the unclustered network where we're just rolling by binomial random uh, variables, random dice. So this Z1, we're going to say, follows a binomial distribution where we have two trials. We have two inactive nodes that we're going to try to activate. We're going to try to activate those with probability P1 because they don't have any previous exposures inside that clique. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here as well because there's a little bit of accounting to do. Um, remember that um, this node is going to, uh, in the next, step if we activate a single node. So it's going to go from a Z1 to a Z2. So this node becomes active, this becomes inactive. And then when we activate this node here, we actually get two extra cliques as well because the network structure that we're dealing with, we're dealing with this very kind of controlled, controlled network structure. So when we flip uh, a Z1 clique diffusion or uh, a Z1 um, uh, kind of clique type to a Z2, we actually get two Z1s uh, as well added back into population. What we're going to do is we're going to track the population of these over time. And that's going to give us our diffusion patterns for all the cliques through the actual network. Um, similar enough, if we have a Z1 that goes to a Z3, uh, well, we activate these two nodes. And so each one of these is going to give off two cliques as well. So we just have to keep a very simple kind of like tally of how many cliques we're keeping in each. Um, the diffusion type over time, and that'll allow us to kind of see how we're um, generating out some sort of diffusion pattern to the actual network using this kind of like motif structure. Um, in the following um, generation, what we can do is we can go from a Z2 to a Z4, where this node is going to become active. We fail to activate them this time to this one. So we don't have a Z3, Z2, to a Z4. Well, we have to be a little bit careful here as well, because this is this is exactly the same pattern that I talked about initially when I was extending the complex contagion to or the ICM to a complex contagion model, where this node has actually received two uh, previous exposures. So all that we say is that okay, well, the Z2 is going to follow a binomial random variable. We have one node to try, we have one trial, one node that we're trying to activate. And this is going to be with the probability of P2. So this is where our complex contagion is going to come into the case. Um, I could write this as a Bernoulli, but just for the sake of like um, 
consistency between all the notations. This is what I end up looking at. Okay, so what we've basically done is we deconstruct the kind of branching process into um, focusing on instead of nodes on cliques by tracking cliques. We can kind of write down a series of kind of uh, rules for which. Uh, if we roll a certain number on a binomial random variable, we're going to add a certain number of uh, Z1 cliques and we're going to change a Z1 clique to Z2 or Z3 or so, and so on. We can do the exact same thing for this higher clique structure, the, the, um, the, the highly cluster network structure, where we have two, uh, each node is a member of two cliques, uh, where each clique has four nodes. There's a little bit more accounting, a little bit of careful, but it's the exact same process. You write down some pretty looking diagrams and you figure out the different probabilities in which you can arrive to the different the cleat diffusion patterns. Um, before we go on and do a little bit of theory, there's a little, there's one or two nice things about this. So instead of tracking the nodes, we're tracking the, the number of diffusion motifs that we have over time. But we can actually just immediately get the number of nodes that we have, because every time that we add uh, as a one click, we're effectively adding a node to the, the network. So by tracking the total number of Z1 clicks, we get an idea of the total number of nodes that we actually have. Um, what we've also done is basically come up with a very neat set of simulation rules for simulating complex contagion on these kind of clustered networks. Whereas before, if we were to do this normally, we'd have to build up a network structure with this kind of click patterns and simulate the diffusion to the actual network. We, if we we're good at coding, we could do that relatively quickly. But in this setting, all we've reduced everything to is uh, just binomial dice rolls. And if we were to compare that to simulations, right? so network-based simulations to stochastic simulations, well, the network-based simulations um, take a lot longer, but we get incredibly good agreement between the network-based simulations and the um, stochastic simulations, provided we have a large enough network so that there's no, um, there's not too much interaction between uh, cliques. So if you have a very small network, you kind of break some of the underlying assumptions of this setup and some reasonable uh, parameters choices as well. But you can, you can get very fast network-based simulations without actually having to track the actual underlying network structure um, if you're interested in a certain kind of parameter region, which is handy for kind of verifying things. And once you have these kind of probabilistic Base rules to go from, you can calculate any kind of distributions that you want from the actual data. Um, that's all nice. It's nice to do simulations, but we might be interested in some sort of analytically tractable results for where we might observe super or subcritical spreading using multi type branching processes. So, Dave, could I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, so one slide before. Oh. Um, this one. So, here when you're going oh. from uh, so when you're going from Z2 to Z4, for instance, mm -hmm. um, you're doing that with like probability P2, right? Because then this white node has had like one exposure. Yeah. Um, but couldn't it be that there's like that white one was also exposed through like another clique because every uh, yeah so itself is it like multiple cliques? Exactly. Like so, if you had a relatively small network structure, you're trying to run this process on it. What you'd get is you kind of break the kind of conditional, the, the assumed kind of like um, uh, not uh, locally tree like, but there's a locally tree like assumption of these kind of clique structures that's going on under the hood here, where yes. if you're running this in a sufficiently large enough graph, that is great, hopefully turns into like a little bit of a rounding error. And that's what we saw on the next slide. Yeah, okay. Um, where we got very good agreement, but I can show you some very nasty stuff that happens if you take a relatively small network structure where this kind of thing completely breaks down, where you actually get, say, uh, because we, once you kind of get up to like a sufficiently high enough proportion of the network infected, the likelihood that this node actually has multiple infections for our exposures from other uh, cliques um, actually comes into play as well. So that's a, that's a very good uh, point that we actually have to be a little bit careful that we're just kind of dealing with um, large network structures at this stage. Is that, a, a, is that any other questions? Or? Yeah. Yeah, okay, um, no, that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. I, try, I was trying to get one pie yet, but spotted it there. Um, so, oh, I did have to go back, so we have to, anyway, sorry. Um, so when we're looking at 
the branching, uh, the simple branching process. Uh, when we're looking at the unclustered network structure, we had the mean number of offspring told us a lot about the criticality of the actual system. It was greater than one. We had uh, supercritical spreading. It was less than one. Uh, we had subcritical spreading. Now, for a multi-type branching process, there's an analog quantity called the mean matrix M. And all this is, is just tells us the expected number of offspring that we get from a single um, Z1, Z2, Z3, or Z4 clique in the subsequent generation. So the entries of this matrix just tells us, so the en entries MIJ just tells us the expected number of ZJ cliques that we might, that we should get from a ZI clique. So uh, if you're going to from a Z1 clique to a Z4 clique, so that's a 1, 4, there's no entry in here because we don't expect any offspring. There's no ways for us to actually produce that particular. Um, and handily, as Mu kind of told us about uh, the size of Mu told us whether the system was critical or not, the size of the largest eigenvalue of this matrix M is going to tell us about the criticality of the system as well. So if that's greater than one, we're super critical, and if it's less than one, it's subcritical. Now, the three click is actually very nice. We can calculate M uh, relatively easily, and we can calculate a um, analytical expression for the criticality of the process uh, on this network structure. Um, if we were to do it for the fourth leak, um, it's not so nice, uh, but we can do it numerically if needs must. Right? Um, it's always nice to have some analytical results uh, as I've been promising them. So if we go back to the unclustered network, and this is the picture that we had originally, where we had this kind of intuition where, where if we start looking at the uh, networks with higher amounts of clustering on, uh, we might expect the subcritical regime to kind of encroach on the region in which we observe the supercritical spreading and the converse um, for high enough alpha where we might have uh, supercritical spreading in regions that we didn't observe the subcritical spreading. So if we take the formula that we had on the previous slide and just plug in values for uh, P1 and alpha, uh, what we see is that our intuition actually is confirmed. We actually get the areas in which um, for this network structure, if we have very low alpha, we get so critical spreading uh, in regions for which we observe supercritical spreading on this one network topology. And there's actually quite a large region for which we can actually get supercritical spreading for a high enough alpha with a low probability of adoption uh, after one exposure. Um, in areas where we observe supercritical or subcritical spreading on the unclustered network structure. So if we looked at the four clique uh, network as well, we just get more, much more exaggerated effect as well. Um, color coding these nicely. Um, what we end up seeing is that, um, the, as we know, uh, this line divides up the case where we just have a two clique network where each node is just a member of six or connected to six random neighbors, the unclosed network structure. Uh, this line divides up where we uh, get supercritical spreading for each node as a member of three, three cliques. And this divides up the supercritical region for the area which we have the supercritical spreading for the two four cliques. The continuous mouthful, just to make sure you say those right, but that's, that's the area in which we have those. And there's a couple of nice things from this, like the areas in which all three networks actually provide supercritical spreading on their own. So all the other network topologies are all subcritical, and there's one set of areas in which each network is uh, supercritical on its own. So this network structure is supercritical in this region on its own, so it's subcritical for the other two. The, the air, this area here is supercritical on its own for this particular network structure. Um, and I like to call this tiny little region here, the kind of Goldilocks zone where you can have uh, so sorry, super critical spreading for the moderately clustered graph. It's got just the right amount of clustering and uh, not so many redundant links to promote super critical spreading uh, in comparison to the other two networks for this very kind of like fine, um, finely tuned kind of parameter sets. So like in comparison to the other two networks, it's got a much smaller kind of region. Um, 
Okay. Um, is there any other questions that we could ask ourselves about uh, what we can immediately get from this kind of like multi-type branching process framework? Well, we can look at the this kind of subcritical regime and ask ourselves, okay, we have these areas in which each network structure gives a supercritical spreading on its own. If we could calculate the expected cascade size for each uh, network structure, there's probably regions that are just continuations of these uh, kind of crossover points here, where we observe super no, uh, we we observe uh, the largest expected cascade sizes for each one of these networks on its own, and we can actually calculate that relatively easily from the theory. Um, there's a couple of uh, other papers that have done simple similar stuff for uh, simple branching processes. Effectively, you just write down the uh, an iteration equation and just uh, set it to the maximum cascade depth and with a little bit of linear algebra you can solve this saving you a little bit of the gory details we've blown up the um goldilocks region here so that's just this triangle here so this is where we observe supercritical spreading for the highly clustered graph on the zone the moderately clustered graph and the unclustered network here and then we also get as we kind of expected um areas in the subcritical regime where each network structure uh, on its own provides supercritical spreading as well. So we get an area in which the um, four clique is supercritical, or not supercritical, has a, uh, the expected cascade size is the largest for the four clique, the three clique, and the unclustered network structure as well. So we've done, in a very short amount of time, a lot of work to try and extend. Excuse uh, me. Oh, yeah. Uh, can I just ask a question about this uh, this figure? Yeah, go for it. Uh, just so here, what is the meaning of the color? It's the different. It's the size of the. Sorry, no. So the um, these uh, it's not necessarily the size of the expected uh, cascade. So the each color is just corresponding to where we observe the expected cascade. Uh, sizes to be largest for, say, in this case, the yellow case and a golden case. This network structure creates expected cascade sizes larger than the other two. And then uh, this color here corresponds to the case where the moderately clustered uh, network provides uh, the largest expected cascade sizes in comparison to the other two networks. And similarly for this one on okay. this area here. Uh, does that make sense? Sorry, uh, I was playing yeah, around yeah. with the graph that were effectively heat maps and it was just getting a little bit messy. So I, I think like the qualitative picture is a little bit um, easier yeah, yeah, no, to no, explain. It's, fine. it's just that you, I cannot uh, understand. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that was a very good question. So I imagine there's multiple other individuals wondering what, what's happening with all these uh, colors as well. Um, so what we've done so far, well, we've taken a branching process description of contagion and extended to accomplice contagion. We've also managed to include clustering in the actual uh, calculations for this as well. Um, we have uh, taken this kind of multi-type branching process extension of um, cascade dynamics, and we're relatively easily uh, able to calculate things like the expected cascade size and the criticality of the system, and we're able to kind of like uh, get a lot of analysis that kind of dropped into our hands without uh, going through too much of like a horror show of calculations. As a little bonus factor, we were able to get like very fast simulations if we were interested in calculating other quantities from the network as well. Um, what we're planning on doing and what uh, we're currently doing is extending. So, like, the, I, I acknowledge that these are very kind of like forehead examples with a very kind of very picky network structure just to kind of for us to play around with, just to kind of see how we might incorporate these things into the network analysis. But what we're doing now is kind of extending these to more heterogeneous degree distributions to look at more kind of more realistic network topologies. Once we can do that, then um, we can look at the relationship of alpha on the actual structure of the actual cascade. So we've talked about the size of the cascade and whether it's super or subcritical, but we can also talk about like the average cascade depth of the structure of reality, these other um, summary measures of these different cascades. And there's been other work that we've done for closer to like simple branching processes using the ICM model to calculate these analytically. So hopefully we'll be able to use some of the knowledge that we had before to calculate 
um, some interesting network uh, cascade summaries and actually pick apart what would we expect if uh, we had a cascade that spread as a complex contagion, how it would be structurally different to a, a simple contagion to an actual network. And then if we build up suffi a sufficient amount of uh, intuition for what's going on here, if we're just given a set of cascades uh, from uh, from Twitter or something else, could we actually recover the different parameters that we actually might have? Would we start off with a network structure and we'd be able to extract the alpha and p one that we had from there, or um, could we do something else a little bit more interesting, a little bit more uh, fun? Um, yeah, so that's kind of like a brief whistle-stop tour of the kind of multi-type branching process stuff that I've been playing around with recently, along with uh, Lee and uh, James Gleason. And I'm happy to take any of your questions now. Thank you very much, Steve. Are there any questions? Would anybody like to ask a question? Uh, I see a hand being raised by Gesina virtually. Yeah, hello, cool. yeah. Uh, a very interesting talk, Dave. Um, I just wondered, so in classical SI uh, dynamics, people look at vaccination strategies as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So can you say something about that, How, what the best intervention would be? Uh, um, the, uh, it's a little bit different in this case, because I suppose we're, I, I was coming at it from like the information diffusion kind of like theory, where you might have some intuition about um, how things spread online, like piece of information. You might run into similar problems if you're using kind of a simple branching process, and the probability is that you one of your nodes that you're going to encounter is going to be um, uh, vaccinated. But you could still implement that as like a, a, a in, in comparison, like instead of having like an increased probability of adoption, maybe a decrease in the probability that um, you would adopt in that particular case. So you might actually have that probability working in reverse to how I would actually have it. Uh, I actually haven't thought about this as a use case for the more simple contagion kind of uh, framework, because if you're looking at, well, actually we could think of it as like a vaccination against bad ideas, I suppose as well. Um, so uh, that, that, that might be where it might come in. So I'd imagine if you could flip that alpha around, that might be uh, one way of doing it. Uh, another way is to completely change away from this kind of like ICM model and maybe think of like a percolation kind of theory where you might think of like, uh, bond site percolation or um, where uh, a node can't adopt it at, uh, at that stage once it's been vaccinated or something along those lines. So you might be implement, able to implement it in that kind of setup, but I would have very little intuition about what the resulting equations might actually look like. Thank you. Hopefully that was useful. <laughs> pertinent question these days with the pandemic going on. Adam, would you like to ask a question? Yes, uh, first, it's a very nice talk. Thank you. Um, when you presented all these analytical results that seem to really rely on uh, your answer to Carl's question that we're sort of assuming an effectively infinite graph where things mm -hmm. split and the different cliques that a node is attached to don't interact with each other at all. Do you have any ideas or approaches that you'd like to try for the cases where interactions between nodes that might have sort of independently been exposed would be important? Yeah, I, it's something I actually haven't thought about. I suppose I've been focusing on just just trying to get as much, squeeze as much out of the current framework that uh, mm -hmm. we currently have. I just had this um, uh, slide here as well. And you can see that if um, the kind of network-based simulations, which are uh, obviously going to encapture the cases where you have, um, you, you, like you have to break down the underlying assumptions of the branching mm -hmm. process framework, uh, it works pretty well. But um, for certain parameter choices, uh, you can see that like there's a you might get a large divergence between the two. Yeah. So um, I know um, oh what's his name Cameron Hall has a very nice way of looking at it. It's not necessarily a cascade perspective, but he he he's he's very cool work where he tries to combine say like this might be an underestimate 
and he comes up with like an, another overestimate and tries yeah. to average the two. So something like that might be not necessarily feasible in this framework, but it could be something to try to try and figure out what happened in those kind of edge cases where um, mm -hmm. you have a, either a small network uh, limit or um, the parameter choice that you pick can cause some of these issues that you see here. Yeah. It, it is a much harder problem. It is very, yeah, it's very hard. So I, I steer clear to it for, for the time being, but uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Hono, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, so, so it was a, a more open question, I suppose. So, so, so if you go back to the paper of Santana a few years back, where he distinguished between simple versus complex contagion, they argued that certain types of items would diffuse more simply and others more in a more complicated way or in a more complex fashion. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wondered, so if I was to give you some, some cascade information of a certain number of items, how this, do you know some work that try to, to distinguish and to, and to assess how much complex is the diffusion of a certain item and maybe mm -hmm. to do some sort of classification of cascades and to, and, to, and to have the complex cascades that are separated from the simple cascades? No, like, so the, the closest I've come with is, uh, to the kind of like a, a kind of hard uh, classic, like it's, it's also a hard problem within kind of like complex contagion because you can, you can have this kind of like um, extension of this ICM model, but then you also might have like threshold models and this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Like, so the, the kind of taxonomy of how you classify stuff can be a little bit hairy. I haven't come across any papers that might uh, shed light on that, but the hope is that you might be able to, like from this kind of framework, if you kind of assume that this works with this tuna parameter, um, if you take like a, a load of different um, cascades, you can simulate what looks similar to all these type of cascades and just chunk them in buckets, hopefully. Um, I, I actually don't know. I, I don't know any of any papers that, because um, that, that seems like a very hard clustering problem to engage, engage in without um, some nice analytical models to try and figure out what features should we care about. But that'll be an interesting place once we play around with heterogeneous degree distributions and seeing the impact of kind of alpha, like do cascades actually look all that much different for mm -hmm. different values in alpha? Or is it like very, like, is there an identifiable identifiability problem where there, is, there might be so much of an overlap that you actually can't distinguish them or um, are they structurally very different from each other? They're structurally very different from each other, then you might be able to do something like that. But yeah, um, I don't have any good intuition, but that's a very good question. I actually definitely should try and do a little bit of a deep dive into literature and see what I can fish out. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Much. If I may ask a question myself, because I don't see any virtual hands raised. Um, so I was, I was going to ask about your intuition regarding degree, um, degree variability. And that sounds like a very complicated problem as well. Um, but maybe there's something already uh, done in the simple contagion process. So what's, if, if you introduce degree variability, how does that, that affect the simple contagion case? And, I hope that's there is there's been some progress there and, and then what's the intuition on your model, Dave? Yeah. So like uh, as we all know, if, if you have hubs and networks, depending on the kind of discrete distribution that you're looking at, those provide like nice uh, through lines into independent communities, depending on how random your network structure is. Um if if you have like highly like if you just take like small, small world network, um uh, those kind of like the strength of the weak highs, the, the small um, links between uh, the, uh, distinct communities actually provides an interesting true line between those two. So in that particular case, if you have a simple contagion with like the small world uh, structure, then you should get faster and further diffusion on those kind of network structures. Handily enough, um, there's been a couple of papers that have looked at things like the clustering coefficient on these types of kind of like clique type networks. So the idea is that if you can write down probability generation functions for your um, complex contagion spread, and you can write down uh, in terms of like the degree distribution or something along those lines. Uh, and if you can write down uh, analytical equations for the expected amount of clustering on a network with a certain degree distribution, and you can marry those two up, you get an, an idea of how you, 
the cascades should spread to a network with different amounts of kind of like um, cross-cutting links that uh, go between vastly different communities uh, versus highly kind of like clustered networks as well. So there's a little bit of um, my kind of intuition is like clustering is going to be very important uh, if you have very high alpha and then um, if you have a lot of kind of like random links between a lot of different communities, um, you, uh, you're just going to have um, a very efficient spread of like a simple contagion. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what we'll observe if we start looking at uh, independent cas uh, cascade, uh, sorry, not independent cascade, uh, empirical cascade, and seeing what kind of diffusion patterns we have from those. That's exactly why I was thinking of degree variability from looking at uh, Twitter data or something like this. Yeah, exactly. Very, cool. Very uh, heterogeneous. So I see a, a virtual hand being raised by you. Hi, I have a question related to the intervention thing because you, you consider the information kind of diffusion. So do you have an idea like how to find the most influ influential nodes? I think it will be because you have regular graph, it will make more sense if you like to choose more than one node in the network. Right? Yeah. Um, on a regular graph, it, because there's, they're effectively everyone, everything is indistinguishable from each other. But the idea is that, again, if we go to a heterogeneous, like if we, when we extend this to a heterogeneous degree distribution, yeah. There's been a lot of work to try and like, okay, how do you identify um, oh, what you call it, influential nodes um, under conditions of certain types of spread? And I think, uh, give me a second, there's a no. So this paper uses a simulation based approach uh, and the ICM model to try and identify um, influential individuals uh, using that. It's, it's, it's very simple. They just basically simulate a lot of cascades and see which one goes big depending on um, what node on the actual network. But if we have an analytical way of writing down um, the expected cascade size uh, on a network, then can you condition on that we're going to see this on a specific node and just see whether we where we get the actual largest expected cascade sizes. And the one thing we know from the literature is that your very first generation is very important uh, in a lot of these cascade spreading processes. So um, I, I guess if it holds similarly for this, you'd assume that uh, you want a um, in a complex contagion kind of framework, uh, not only a high degree node, but a high degree node that connects to a lot of kind of like transitive links as well in the network as well. And then they, they might be uh, highly influential, but the interesting part is then with that intuition, can you back out a nice way of calculating a uh, network-based um, centrality measure? And I think I have a nice way of doing that, but I won't say it because it could be completely wrong, but uh, based on <laughs> kind of like density of triangle networks. But yeah, that's, that's one thing that I'm hopefully gonna play around with when I get a little bit more time. Thanks very much, great question. Thank you. All right, um, if there are no more questions, we're spot on on the hour. Uh, so I think this is a good place to stop. So thank you again for coming, Dave. Very yeah, nice great. talk.